Hey guys, in this lesson, I'm going to cover ALB and NLB deployments in a bit more detail. So let's start looking at an application load balancer. With ALBs and NLBs, we always have target groups, and that's where we can register our instances. The target groups define the target type. So for example, is it an instance? Is it a Lambda function? Is it an IP address? And the target protocol and port. The target protocol and port is the protocol and port on which the application is running on the instance itself. So if it's a web server, it's going to be HTTP 80 or HTTPS port 443 by default. Next, we have the VPC that the instances are in and health checks. So the health checks define which port and protocol is going to be used by the load balancer to check whether the instances are available and healthy and ready to receive connections. And only if they are, will it forward any connections to them. And then we've got the registered targets themselves. So we can register the targets manually, or we can attach the target group to an auto scaling group and they'll be registered dynamically as they're launched and removed when they're terminated by the ASG. We then have our load balancer. On the load balancer, there is a listener. Here we get to define the protocol and port that the load balancer listens on. And this can be different to the target group protocol and port. We have routing rules for an application load balancer, and we can assign certificates for encryption as well. We can also define the network mapping, so which availability zones and subnets are our instances going to be registered into. Now, when we do that, when we actually define those availability zones and subnets, the load balancer deploys its nodes into each availability zone that it's mapped to. So these are the actual deployments of the load balancer itself. They're added to each of these AZs. Now we can actually send traffic through to our instances in the target group. Let's have a look at the supported configurations for ALB versus NLB. For ALB, the target type can be instance, IP address, or Lambda function. The protocol must be HTTP and HTTPS. Also, the health check protocol must be HTTP or HTTPS as well. You cannot use TCP even if you specify the correct port number like TCP 80. You won't actually be able to see the target group when you create the load balancer through the console and you won't be able to attach it by any means. You can also define rules for advanced request routing with the ALB but not with the NLB. Now the NLB has targets which can be instances, IP addresses or application load balancers. The reason ALB is in there is because you can put a network load balancer in front of an ALB. That might help you with connections. So the network load balancer provides very low latency. So it's great for large numbers of connections with very minimal latency. And then you can have your application load balancers behind the NLB. The target group protocol must be TCP or UDP for an NLB and any health check protocol is supported. You can also define the elastic IPs per subnet. That's something that's specific to the NLB. So now you can have a static public IP address assigned to those nodes that are running in each availability zone. Now we have advanced request routing with the ALB. Let's have a look at how that works. Here we have instances across multiple AZs and organized into different target groups. The target groups are used to then route requests through to those specific instances, which may be running different components of an application. Then we have our load balancer, which has a listener. ALBs, as you know, listen on HTTP protocol or HTTPS. With path-based routing, we can actually specify rules and the rules will look at the URL. So remember that a load balancer, an application load balancer is a layer seven load balancer. And so it can look at information in the HTTP header at layer seven. And that includes in this case, the path. So we can route requests to different target groups based on the path here. We've got example.com slash specials or slash orders, and they're going to different target groups different components of our application. That's path-based routing. With host-based routing, we have a different host header, members.example.com, and the request is going to forward through to target group three. So we can combine these as well. We can have host-based routing and path-based routing, and there are several other different mechanisms we can use for advanced request routing with the ALB. So with host-based routing, we're routing based on the host field in the HTTP header, essentially the subdomain in this example. Targets for the ALB can be EC2 instances, IP addresses, or Lambda functions. Next, we have the network load balancer. And here we have two target groups and an NLB. 
we can assign elastic IPs in each subnet that the load balancer is connected to. The NLBs will listen on TCP, TLS, UDP or TCP underscore UDP. The NLB does not support the advanced request routing that the ALB does, but you can create multiple listeners and listen on different ports. So in this case, the separate listener on a unique port is added and then requests for that specific application running on that port number can be forwarded to a different target group. You could do that on an ALB as well. You can have multiple listeners with different ports and they always do have to be different ports. You can only have one listener per load balancer for an individual port number. Here requests are routed based on the IP protocol data. So what is the port number that we're connecting to? Targets can be EC2 instances, IP addresses, or ALBs, as we mentioned before. Targets can also be outside of a VPC. So for example, they could be in an on-premises data center. Now here's a question, what is the source IP address that the application is going to see? So connections come into the load balancer and we want to understand what is the source IP address of the client. Comes up in exam questions sometimes, also is important to understand if you need to log that information, potentially you need to do some kind of screening as well. It could be for licenses, it could be for security purposes. So let's say that the client's IP address on the internet is A. And here we have the load balancer. The load balancer has nodes and those nodes have IP addresses. So let's say that the node that it's being forwarded through is B. The CLB and the ALB use the private IP address of their ENIs as the source address. So in this case, the application is going to see IP equals B. Okay, so it's going to see, so the application running here is going to see that the client is actually the load balancer itself. It doesn't see the address of the client. With an NLB, again, we've got the IP address is A for the client, IP address is B for the nodes of the load balancer. Now, if the instance is specified by instance ID, when you add it to the target group, then the IP address is going to be A. So the application is going to see the IP address of the client. So that could be useful for logging purposes or other security purposes as well. Now, if in the same circumstance, however, the only difference being that we've specified the instance by IP address instead of instance ID, in that case, the IP address seen by the application is B, okay, the load balancer nodes. Now, what I've just shown you with the NLBs is applicable when you're using TCP and TLS. If you're using UDP or TCP underscore UDP, then the IP address is going to be A. A little bit confusing, I know, and it really depends on the different ports and protocols, but there is a great link which I'll share with you that you can follow to the AWS website where you can read a lot more about this and hopefully it will make sense once you've been through that as well as watching this video. When using an NLB with a VPC endpoint or global accelerator, the source IP addresses are the private IPs of the NLB nodes. Lastly, the X forwarded for can be used with the ALB to capture client IPs. X forwarded for is a type of header. What it means is if we enable that header in our application, then we will actually be able to capture those client IP addresses. So they are actually there somewhere in the IP protocol information that's being sent through, but we need to enable this specific header.